Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us back here at No Earthly Explanations. This is Brittany Barbieri with her amazing, fantastic co-host, Mr. Don Schmidt. Hi, Don. Hi, Britt. So happy to be with you again on this second episode. My God, they're flying by to the point that we're already talking about our 10th and our 20th and even three years from now. So <laughs> We're just getting started, ladies and gentlemen, so That's welcome right, back. Everybody. Yes, and buckle up, because tonight's episode is going to be a little bit of a quick history lesson, but also, this is, if everybody wasn't paying attention to the last episode, this is the 75th anniversary of Roswell. And for those of you that don't know a lot of the true history of Roswell, I would like to hand it over to the boss man himself in regards to Roswell and the crash of 47 that kind of is the hot smoking gun that's still blazing today. So in honor of the amazing anniversary, we're gonna kick this episode off with Roswell. Don, that's on you, my friend. Imagine 75 years ago, the granddaddy of all UFO cases took place. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind that the United States government slash the Army Air Corps back on July 8th of 1947, put out that famous press release. And so, but what led up to that? New Mexico was the hotbed of all military activity post-World War II. In fact, whenever I'm on college campuses lecturing, I'm amazed with the learned faculty often present and I pose the question, where was the first atomic bomb detonated? And how often, you know, they'll well, quickly, well, oh, of course, Japan. Well, how about New Mexico? How about just two hours west of Roswell? And you had not only ongoing atomic research at Los Alamos in New Mexico, you had all the testing of the captured German V-2 rockets at the White Sands Proving Grounds in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And just south of Roswell, you had the Roswell Army Airfield, where the first atomic bomb squadron was headquartered, the best officers, the best pilots, crew, doctors, nurses. If you swept the broom back on that base back in 1947, it was because you were the best sweeper in the entire U.S. military because you all had a top security clearance on the atomic bomb. Well, according to the United States Air Force Project Blue Book, the most famous of the three official investigations of the UFO phenomenon, there were more UFO sightings in New Mexico at that time than anywhere else in the world. It was as though someone else was very interested in our military potential. And what better location than New Mexico? Late evening of July 2nd, severe lightning storm in the high desert of Lincoln County. And ranchers described that between the thunder claps, they heard what sounded like an explosion. Next morning, a ranch foreman by the name of W.W. Brazo discovers a debris field of the strangest material that he's ever seen, ever handled. It defied conventional explanation. He had never seen anything like it before. And a number of days later, on Sunday, July 6th, he made the long trek into Roswell. But he didn't go to the military. He went to the sheriff, Sheriff George Wilcox. And there, too, none of his deputies, the sheriff, no one's able to identify this strange wreckage. So the sheriff contacts the Roswell Army Airfield. And it's there that the head of intelligence, Major Jesse Marcel, comes to personally investigate the find. And keeping in mind, it's a 4th of July weekend. It's important enough that they bring this to the attention of the base commander, Colonel William Blanchard. And Blanchard dispatches Marcel, as well as a counterintelligence officer, Captain Sheridan Cabot. They make the long trek out to the debris field, and they're amazed by the amount of debris. It covers an area of almost a mile long. They gather up, they fill two entire vehicles of the wreckage, and they're still extensive debris covering the area. They return back to the base and that next morning, they have a staff meeting and at noon mountain time, they put out that famous press release 
that they had actually captured a flying saucer. They got one. We actually have in our possession a flying disc. Five hours later, Colonel Blanchard's boss, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, has a press conference. Not in Roswell, but at his office in Fort Worth, Texas, at Carswell Army Airfield, where they explain it all away as being nothing more than a weather balloon with a radar reflector kite. Reflective foil, wooden sticks, wood, uh, string, tape, and neoprene rubber, off-the-shelf material that a five-year-old child would have recognized. But Major Marcel, upon retiring, a lieutenant colonel, and 30 years later, when he was diagnosed with terminal emphysema, he broke his oath of security. He went public, and he stated, quote, being familiar with all materials, both foreign and domestic, this was nothing made on this earth, end quote. And that's when the floodgates opened. That's when, to date, we've interviewed over 600 witnesses, both directly and indirectly involved. And they all have testified that this was nothing made on this earth, that the materials defied conventional explanation, and then when you start talking about the bodies recovered, and as one of the personnel, when we did CBS 48 Hours, when asked, well, how do you know they weren't from here? To which he responded, they sure weren't from Texas. So we're dealing with a case of something that is not just a fleeing, a fleeting glimpse of some other technology not just the light in the sky, not just something that landed on the ground and it took off and we have nothing but a charred circle of ground or, or broken branches or that type of thing. No, with Roswell, you're talking about hardware. You're talking about the recovery of a ship. You're talking about the remains of the crew. You're talking about something that you could go across the street and kick the tires if you desired. And so... Here we are talking about the granddaddy of them all and the fact that it's the 75th anniversary and the fact that it hasn't gone away. If I were to inform the audience that the United States government is presently up to four official explanations regarding Roswell, and I always joke that husbands should try that with their wives if they come home too late. <laughs> and yet government always gets away with the fact that this deception continues. But that's where this show is going to be an example of where uh, not on our watch, not as far as by all the testimony of all the witnesses that are now all long gone. And yet as a tribute and a commemoration of their bravery and the fact that they have gone public, the fact that they did go on the record, they signed sworn affidavits attesting to the fact that this did happen. Roswell has become synonymous with not only cover up, but the fact that we have in our possession an actual craft of unknown origin that was not made on this earth. Yep, <clears throat> Don, that was beautiful. You started from ground zero and all the way right through it. That was and a awesome. half hour later, no, no, I think we. Half hour later. No, not even close. You're fine. Good. The thing is, I could always listen to you talk about Roswell forever. I could always, I like, that's why I always love asking questions or even <laughs> just chatting. I love coming right back to it. I, I, and I think it's, and as I've often been told, I think it's because of the passion and mainly for the fact that I was a total skeptic. We talked about this the first episode, that I was a total skeptic. And that when you walk the walk, when you are proactive, when you actually, without a preconceived theory as to what you anticipate, what you're going to cherry pick, what you're going to, as far as develop, as far as your case to support your position. Whereas what we have done from day one is we allow the evidence, we allow the information to take us on this ride, on this journey. And wherever we happen to land, that is the final resolution. And the fact that we're the ones that forced the government to come up with their third and fourth explanation. Right. When you read 
reports were, you know, were named extensively. But the problem is they never spoke to a single one of our witnesses. They wouldn't dare because they'd be hearing information, testimony contrary to their preconceived cover-up. And again, we will not let them get away with that. It's well, not the truth. <clears throat> no, and you take it back, like, let's go back, right, to the crash. And the first cover-up statement of it being a wonderful weather balloon. They all push that one, which is still seems to be the number one. It's a weather balloon. Let it go. What always fascinated me, and this would be a question for you, at the time, weather balloons, as they said, there were bodies at the wreckage. They said they were crash dummies. Now, crash dummies on average are of what size, Don? Let's just, let's just, let's just entertain this topic for a second. They're normal people's height between five, six to five, eight as test dummies, right? Yet all the statements from Roswell, New Mexico that saw the crash and the bodies, everybody that had seen it, their statement was that these bodies were child size. Right. Correct. So but let's, there isn't any <laughs> legitimate journalist, researcher, skeptic who performs due diligence, mm -hmm. who just does their own level of research, can place a crash dummy anywhere in New Mexico in July of 1947 for one simple reason. Whether it was Project Excelsior or Project High Dive, which the Air Force claims, maintains to this day, they didn't originate until 1952. So unless you're talking about time travel, how in God's name are you able to put them, move them five years into the past when the project didn't even originate till five years later? So sorry, end of argument, end of debate. There's no way that you are going to win that argument because on top of it, all of the principal witnesses to the bodies, whether military or civilian, were not even in New Mexico in 1952. So, sorry, again, it's a non-secular. It's, 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 you don't even lay, and I'm talking about you, Britt, but any reporter, well, don't they say they were crash dummies? Well, why don't you actually look into it? Because you'll find right. that the explanation is lost. It's a false premise before it even takes off. So let's scratch the fourth explanation. It need not even apply. Right. Well, and that's why I always brought that up because I, it always has made me chuckle and laugh at that even that that even came up or was even brought up as a, well, we'll just say this to the general public that they were crash dummies to get rid of the bodies because there were so many eyewitnesses that saw bodies that we're just right. going to say they were crash dummies. So, you know, okay. Yeah. And that going with multiple sites and crashes afterwards. Oh, they were more just test dummies. No, I don't think test dummies get up and walk away. <laughs> and, these are test dummies, and these are test dummies that were in jumpsuits and with harnesses right. and with parachutes. And we even tracked down the son whose father created these particular crash dummies. Mm -hmm. And he was livid. He was especially upset for the fact that every time in 1952, when the projects originated, that they would have a test drop. And these test dummies would impact with the ground they would break up into dozens of pieces. There would be limbs flying every which way. And yet we don't have any accounts of decapitated or severed limbs. We don't have any accounts of bodies with jumpsuits and harnesses. And we certainly don't have any accounts of bodies that are six foot tall with parachutes. No. So please, again, you're, you're, you're playing off of the naivety of the public and thinking that, well, if the government states, you know, the solution or the explanation, it must be true. And I would then also raise the, uh, the, uh, the proposition, when has the government ever told us the truth about most anything? 
I mean, let's let's. I throw the onus back on, on the press. Give me an example. Give me an example where you walked away 100% satisfied that the government was providing you with the actual explanation, and then we'll reconsider that maybe this might be the second. But again, we can full heartedly scratch the crash dummy just for the fact it's five years separated not even happening the same year. Well, but not even that, Don. Let's let's talk about this for a second. So a weather balloon. Let's just talk about that. There is a huge difference in the material of a weather balloon versus the material in which was gathered at the site. And what was totally. stated of how it moved and how it felt, how it looked, right. the texture. I don't right. care how naive they think that the civilians were. But no matter what in that time, if it really was a weather balloon, these people would have known. Weather balloons have not changed much in how they look since the 40s. So they would have known, oh, there's a weather balloon out here. Hey, guys, we've got a weather balloon in the field. It would not have been, there wouldn't have been multiple sites of an impact and a crash and all these different debris fields. It would not have progressed to this. So my question for you, Don, is that when the military showed up, wouldn't they have known, hey, false alarm, everybody. We're just looking at a weather balloon. No, no don't only, brazzle about the property. It's just a weather balloon. And the thing is, not only would the military, and again, we're talking the 509th bomb group, the first atomic bomb squadron in the world, the elite, the best in our US, they were the best in the world at that time. And the idea that the first and only time that a weather balloon was wrongly misidentified as a flying saucer never happened right. before and has not happened since. The idea that the very people in charge of the atomic bomb would not have recognized materials, off the shelf materials, that a five year old child would have had absolutely no difficulty in identifying. And not only the rancher, not only his neighbors, not only a state police officer who was involved, mm -hmm. then down to the sheriff and his deputies, and then the head of intelligence and the base commander and the other officers involved. The fact that one by one, not, not a single one of these individuals said, wait a minute, I think that's a piece of lead foil. Or wait a minute, I believe that's a piece of rubber. I think my tires are made of that on my pickup truck. <laughs> or, oh, string, oh, string. Oh, yeah, I, I use string once in a while to tie up as far as a, a loose uh, fence post, as far as wire, that type of thing. And yeah. so the fact that nobody, nobody, they cannot demonstrate a single witness that said, let's stop for a moment and reconsider that maybe this might be something prosaic. Maybe this is something conventional. But the fact that they behaved from the very beginning that this was extraordinary. Now we haven't even gotten into the types of material involved, whether it's this paper thin, practically weightless material that you couldn't cut, you couldn't burn, even a bullet wouldn't penetrate. We had engineers at the base describe how they took a 16 pound sledgehammer. Now I would proffer that anyone listening to the show Next time you're in a Home Depot, any hardware store, pick up a 16 pound hammer. It'll go through your car like tissue paper. Mm -hmm. And yet the engineers describe that they had a, a, a section about four foot in diameter. That as often as they pounded on it over and over again, it just bounced right off. Not a scratch, not a, a, a marring of the material whatsoever. And then you had I-beam structures, like as thick as the a, 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 a number two pencil, with strange symbols that ran the length of each piece. Never deciphered, never seen anything like it before. And then you had silken strands of material that you could <clears> hold <throat> in up the one end, and the light would emit out the opposite end, out the opposing end. Well, they're describing fiber, fiber optics. In 1947, the fiber optics weren't developed until around 1970. 
And then the most amazing material of all, which we still refer to as our Holy Grail. It's what in all of our archeological projects we're still searching for because this would break this wide open overnight. It was the same paper thin metal like material that you couldn't cut, you couldn't burn, a bullet wouldn't penetrate. And yet this you could crease, you could fold, you could crunch into a ball. And every time you would release your grip and place it onto a surface, it would slowly unravel, flow like water, as it would slowly assume its original shape and size. We don't even have such material today. And yet this is what all the eyewitnesses described back in 1947, 75 years ago. Material that even 75 years later, we have not been able to replicate. We haven't been able to, you know, duplicate or reverse engineer. And that's what the eyewitnesses, now does that, does any of that sound like a weather balloon? Does any of it sound like an airplane or, or, or a rocket or anything conventional? No, it defies all conventional explanation. And yet that's where they hope that you'll just accept without any reservation their second, third, and fourth resolution, their explanations. Because after all, we're the government and we're only here to help you. Well, <laughs> all I can say is if anybody still feels that way after all these years, it's because they get a check in the mail. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to demean anyone who does depend on a government check, but it's the only thing that may be helping us. It certainly hasn't been in telling us the truth on anything of a historic nature. And Roswell would be at the top of that list. Well, and I wanna go back for a second because that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you <clears throat> to come forward with and, and definitely confirm because there was a lot of speculation and I know that a lot of people talk back and forth about it in regards to the material that was seen and at the wreckage of the crash site that there was a type of writing hieroglyph that was found in pattern on part. And it was nothing that anybody could ever like identify. Correct. And um, I know that there were times where it was stated that someone had tried to draw it out as a, as like mm -hmm. a memory, just to like, this is what it looked like. And Correct. they had tried to have it deciphered and it couldn't be. So that, that was, I'm glad you mentioned it because my question for you with that was, you know, was that truly seen? Was that mm -hmm. seen by the rancher? Was that seen by multiple other eyewitnesses yes. before the cleanup? Absolutely, both military and civilian and described in a similar uh, fashion from witness to witness. Uh, personally, the, uh, the, the uh, most detailed description of the wreckage and those hieroglyphic like sim symbols was the late doctor slash Colonel Jesse Marcel Jr., the son of the intelligence officer upon his return back to the base, two o'clock in the morning, they lived uh, about 10 miles off of the base proper. And Jess Jr. was an only, only child at the time. And he felt his father felt it important enough that at two o'clock in the morning, he, he, he would wake up his wife, uh, Vi, as well as Jess Jr., take them into the kitchen. And there, all this wreckage was scattered on the kitchen floor, on the kitchen table. And it was Jess Jr. who then pointed out, what, what are these symbols, Dad? I've never, you know, and it was important enough that we had Dr. Uh, John Watkins, who was Professor Emeritus, of the University of Montana at Missoula. He was famous for getting the hillside strangler to confess under hypnosis. And so we had Dr. Watkins take Jess Jr. back to that occurrence, to that night or that early morning and relive that experience. And this was done in the presence of a film crew 
from NBC Today Show. And so where Dr. Marcel was taken back to relive this in the first person wow. and repeating exactly who said what and under what circumstances and the fact that his father in his re accounting that night, that early morning, over and over again, flying saucer, flying saucer, absolutely no mention of this being anything else. That right. this was wreckage from an actual flying saucer, not made on this planet. And then under hypnosis, Dr. Marcel then sketched out the symbology. And what was amazing was that it matched his own father's almost identically. And then matched others who would describe and sketch out that same symbology. What we did not account for as just an interesting side to the story was that Jess had just lost his dad four years before. And as an example of just how real, how deep he was in the trance, the regression in recounting, retelling that experience, that when he was brought out of the hypnosis by Dr. Watkins, and he opened his eyes and his first reaction was dad, dad, as he looked from one side of the room to the other, that his dad was there. Mm. And then when he realized he wasn't and the tears started to stream and we went, oh my God, we just caused Jess to lose his dad all oh, over again. But I, I mentioned that Ugh. because in their <laughs> omnipotent wisdom, NBC, and specifically the host of today, Brian Gumbel, decided not to use the footage because, as he said, it was too controversial. It was too convincing. Those were the two words he used. Wow. So it's like, you don't want the truth? You don't want something that's so convincing? A doctor actually recounting an experience involving possible wreckage of a genuine flying saucer? Whose side are you on? Are you a true journalist? Or are, again, you just a patsy for the government. You just do as far as they wind you up and you just repeat talking points. And the irony is that Gumbo then goes on to host the two-hour primetime that we did on the Sci-Fi Channel on our archaeological dig in 2002. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, the irony, as I said, the fact that he came full circle and that uh, he was, uh, or I say, I, I should say he made a full 180 and that he then was speaking in favor of Roswell. But wouldn't we love to have that, uh, that footage? Oh, yeah. Because NBC uh, conveniently lost it. We don't have that. And Dr. Watkins is gone. Dr. Marcel is gone. But we were there. We were witness to it. We provided all the questions. And I will never forget the fact that when he woke up, it was that real that he lost his dad all over again. Well, and that's haunting. I mean, that's haunting for, for you and for all of us to hear it and for the listeners, because, you know, for somebody to have to relive that, knowing that four years before he had already lost his dad and then to know that it was that real to him and then to come out of it and to have to relive the death again to realize his dad is gone. But right, right. there's something else in that key factor. There's a key factor, excuse me, to that, to that story and to his trance he was that close to his father they had that tight of a relationship Good so point. so father, knowing that sorry yep yeah, his father that summer before the first drop on hiroshima in japan mm -hmm. his father did a sketch of fat man the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and told him, father to son, that this was going to end the war. This was going to end World War II. It was going to save a million lives. But then he added, now you can't tell anybody about this. And Jess Jr. would describe how his father then crumbled up the sketch 
and then with his lighter in an ashtray, destroyed it. And so you're absolutely correct, Britt, that they were that close. And to the day his father died, that he swore that what he held in his hands was not made on this earth. What would possess someone that close to their son to deceive them, to lie about it? But the point also was his son became a supportive, a corroborative witness to what mm -hmm. they both held in their hands. And they were that close. And so I have no doubt. I, I've seen through the years how they, they, they tried to destroy his father because right. he would comments well let's keep in mind he was also the patsy he was the mm -hmm. fall guy he was the one who was ordered to pose with the substituted weather balloon with a radar reflector kite exactly. balloons that they were launching in roswell every day in conjunction with bomb drop exercises that they were conducting and so now, they were more familiar with the weather balloons than anyone but when, <clears throat> what I find really funny, and you can correct this if I'm wrong, but when they went to pose for that famous photo that everybody sees right now, mm -hmm. it was, he was shocked that the material that they brought in for the photo was not what he saw and what they had. He almost chuckled at the fact that they were having him pose with aluminum foil because this was not what he had. I mean, he was ordered by the base commander's boss, General Ramey, to bring some of the actual material, which he did, to his office. And then it was General Ramey who took him to an adjoining map room. I want to see where this all went down. And when they returned back to the room, the real stuff was gone. And in its place was the shredded radar kite with the neoprene balloon on mm -hmm. the floor. General Ramey waves in one single reporter by the name of James B. Johnson with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and he takes a series of pictures. And the crazy thing, Britt, is that General Ramey's chief of staff was Colonel at that time, Thomas Jefferson DeBose. Well, we interviewed DeBose as a Brigadier General two years before he died. We have a sworn affidavit from him I met with him again at his home in Orlando. I would speak to him. I have handwritten letters where he described that they were the ones who substituted the weather balloon for the actual material. So there was another material that was substituted by this weather balloon wreckage. Well, you didn't read about that in the press. We went to USA Today. We went to the New York Times. We went to the Washington Post. We have a general officer who is stating that the balloon is a hoax. I was there. I'm in the photographs with the substituted weather balloon. We're the ones who switched it. And how did the press react? Well, the government says it's just the weather balloon. Yeah, but I was there. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, government says, the government says, again, anyone says to me, the government says, end of debate, end of argument. You've lost before you've even started because the government, again, has been deceiving the public for 75 years on Roswell. And I'm not about to argue with you because you've lost again before you've even started. Well, it's not even just Roswell. Roswell started it. Now they're still doing it. <laughs> with any other information regarding any ufos or uaps that come out in information but and isn't it interesting that the air force is, is strangely silent right now in the face of everything that has been coming out that the arbiters of the cover-up are the very people that are, are the most quiet right now right because they're the ones that have been covering this up since roswell and they have well, no explanation no, and in a way, they kind of want it to go away. They want people to stop asking about it. But here we are, 75 years later, we're still talking about it. And we're going to keep talking about it until the truth comes out. You just, you can't, you can't silence something so noisy. I'm sorry, you can't. So I want to take it back. Let's go back again. And as you said, they asked Jesse, walk us through 
you know, the impact. Let's walk through how this happened, where this trend, map it out, show us on the map. Here we go. So I think we should walk back. I want to walk back through the impact of the saucer, of the flying saucer, right? Of the UFO. And I want to talk about the debris field versus the impact site, because obviously there's different areas. And I would like for you to describe um, from, from your field work and from your work with the, with, especially for the listeners, the archeological stuff that you've done. And now the one coming up in May again, I, I just really want to see how, and even for my own interest, how did we get so many areas? How did it turn into, we have some debris here. We have the right. impact site of the saucer. Right. We know crashed here. Then we have where the bodies laid out, where more debris was. So let's, let's walk through that. I want to hear it. I want to go through that with you. And again, this is from multiple sources who were involved, who were there, who were part of investigations to determine how this object crashed, what caused it to crash. And Major Marcel, he emphasized this, that when they first arrived at the debris field, this is just one of numerous sites, as you just point out, Britt. The mm -hmm. first thing that impressed them was just how much debris, how much wreckage there was. They couldn't get over it. There was just so much of it. And then the fact that it covered an area of almost a mile long, which again, as military experts, military officers who had been involved with plane crashes and other crash investigations, they immediately realized that this was a mid-air explosion. It wasn't an impact crash. That something had caused it to explode and rain debris down throughout that particular region. Okay. When Dr. Lincoln La Paz, he was the famous meteor expert. He was part of the Manhattan Project, the development of the atomic bomb. He specialized and he developed the technique of triangulation. The idea that to determining that as witnesses would describe the angle, the trajectory, the light approach from the azimuth as far as uh, of the light source to the point that it apparently impacted with the ground is how they would recover uh, a meteorites, for example. And so uh, Lewis Rickett, who was a non-commissioned master sergeant who worked with La Paz three weeks, he was assigned to assist him in the field to determine the speed and trajectory of the Roswell object. Well, how does a weather balloon have speed and trajectory? So according to Rickett, they discovered five miles north of the, of the debris field, a touchdown site where the ground had been crystallized. Well, we've confirmed that with other ranchers, hired hands, who described that there was an area of ground that had been exposed to extensive extreme heat that had turned the soil, the sand, into glass. So we have numerous first-hand witnesses to that effect. Rickett described to us that they found additional debris at that location. So you have debris at a touchdown site. And according to Rickett, based on the report that La Paz wrote up for the Pentagon, that the object was in trouble. It was having some type of uh, mechanical difficulty for whatever reason. And that is, it, it, as it attempted to lift off, it exploded, raining debris as far as through that particular area, which would then be discovered by W.W. Brazo, the ranch foreman, which was a site that Marcel and the counterintelligence officer Cabot would be led back to by the ranch foreman. And then there was a secondary body site about two and a half miles east, southeast along that same trajectory that two crewmen were either sucked out because due to the decompression or the percussion of the explosion mm -hmm. atop a bluff two and a half miles from that debris field. 
and then another 20, 25 miles along that same trajectory line, east, southeast, about 35 miles north of Roswell, an impact site, a final impact where a pod about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, egg-shaped, a capsule, had impacted. And this is where three additional bodies plus a survivor were recovered. And we have the sheriff, deputies, firemen, as well as the full recovery operation of the military involved at that location. And we have all those additional witnesses to that. So we have four distinct locations as part of one single event, one object, a touchdown, an explosion with a debris field, a secondary uh, re a body location, and then a final impact of a pod uh, shaped craft with the crew and a survivor, all part of this one incident that happened on July 2nd of 1947. Now, so how, and this is gonna be uh, where a lot of the confusion questions come in for, um, I know a lot of the listeners too, probably have heard this over the years, there's always a lot of mixed commotion of, oh, there were only three bodies at the site recovered. Mm -hmm. And that included, you know, one of the survivors, the, one of the survivors was one of the three. But I would like for you to correct that. I would like for you to tell how many bodies were actually involved in this so-called weather balloon incident where, you know, right. there was only two dummies at the site, according to well, his. And it's simply, it, it comes down to Brett, a case of from one's perspective. Uh, for example, there would be the case of uh, Melvin Brown, who was with K-Squad, and he was assigned as a military police officer posted behind one of the ambulance trucks okay. out at the debris field. And, and more accurately, the bluff where the two bodies were recovered, two and a half miles from that debris field. And he's told to keep his eyes forward. And first chance he gets, he pulls up the canvas tarp behind the truck and he witnesses two bodies. And to his very deathbed, he kept it secret until he finally confided to his wife and his two daughters that he saw two of the bodies recovered at the Roswell crash site. Well, from his uh, vantage point, he saw two bodies. But right. if then others at the impact site they would have seen three additional plus the survivor. So it all comes down to your perspective. It all comes down to your involvement. So I know the skeptics have suggested, well, so-and-so only said two, or so-and-so only said they saw one at the base hospital uh, back at Roswell, or so-and-so only saw a survivor. Again, it's a simple case as where you happen to be involved as far as in recreating the scene of the crime, so to speak. But putting it all together as part of the official investigation, there were a total of four bodies, actually five bodies, excuse me, five bodies plus one survivor. Two at the secondary body site, three at the impact site, plus a survivor. Okay. So that definitely clarifies, even for myself, because over the years, even in my own research, the numbers are all over the place. They're always right. all over the place. It's always, well, there was only three and that included, you know, and even if you watch television reenactments, they only show three or four, maybe like when they talk about the bodies being recovered, you know, they and, don't, it's like, it's never depicted you know, correctly. And as there were even two separate body flights that went out from Roswell and the one that went out on the uh, 7th and the mm -hmm. one that went out, or excuse me, went out later on the 8th and the one that went out late afternoon on July 9th, a day after the weather balloon explanation. And we can tell you the aircraft, we can tell you the tail numbers, we can tell you the pilots, the co-pilots, the crew members on those very separate flights. But the point being that it required two separate aircraft just to transport the bodies. Again, suggesting that depending mm -hmm. on one's involvement and one's vantage point, you didn't have the full picture until everything is gathered and you are 
cataloging, you are logging, so to speak, the event. And that's where you get the final tally. Ah, we have a total of, 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 of uh, five bodies plus one survivor, that type of thing. And even the survivor would, would, have, would have been treated separately from those two body flights. Well, yeah, he would have been separated. The, you know, that, that being would have been completely separated. The fact that he was still alive and somewhat breathing and they were keeping him alive, you know, to basically, uh, you know, to start the process as we would do. And it's, it's painful for me because when you think about that night unfolding for these beings, you know, there's several questions that pop into my head. And one of which I'll ask you is, is it possible that we may have been aware that something was in our atmosphere and we shot it down? We contributed to this explosion. We contributed to their their saucer malfunctioning because we we knew they were we knew it was happening. You know, granted, we don't have a lot of the radar systems we have now. We have grown immensely. But one of the questions that pop up is because it exploded in midair and it was trying to get away. It didn't really want to crash here. It didn't want to land here. Is it possible that we had a hand in that? Is it possible? I was always very reluctant to believe that we had anything to do with the, the crash itself. Whether it was a case of where we brought it down either directly or indirectly, accidentally or intentionally, I was more willing to accept the fact that there was a severe lightning storm, which we've confirmed through the Stallion Weather Network at that time. We can document there was a severe lightning storm that came off of the Southern Capitan Mountains at the time in question between 11, 1130, that late evening of, of July 2nd. And so lightning has always been a, a, a possibility or just a, a emitter, uh, a, a internal malfunction mm -hmm. that caused it a difficulty and it, it caused it to explode, it caused it to break up. And then the question would be, well, the materials were so nearly indestructible, how did, how did it even break up? Well, the question then, the answer is simply a case of if something is manufactured, if something is malleable at the point that it can be assembled, it has to then, it has a, a stress point, a breaking point. It's just that their fracture point is much higher than ours. Ours may be at, you know, point one or two and theirs may be at point 10 or 20. And it reached that point. Whatever caused it to explode, it reached their fracture point. Okay? So okay. the question has then rearisen with a discussion I had with a, a radar technician who is retired, formerly worked with the CIA. And he actually suggested, Don, you need to go back and look at radar, which was in its infancy back in 1947. It was very primitive, no question. And so there were no set frequencies. There were no set uh, codes or regulations as to the power that radar frequencies were transmitted. Because again, we didn't know that there were certain levels that needed uh, to be restrained. We didn't know that there were certain levels that may even have a detrimental impact on our own aircraft at that time. Right. And White Sands Proving Ground in El Margordo, New Mexico, a couple, mile, uh, a couple hours west of Roswell, was the only radar facility in the world at that time that tracked both incoming and departing aircraft. And it was mainly because we were experimenting, we were conducting a lot of rocket launches, especially with the uh, German the captured German V-2 rockets after the end of World War II. So all the other airports, the other military bases were simply tracking incoming. So they weren't at that, that frequency, that white sands, which happens to be about an hour and a half southwest of the debris field where this all happened back in 1947. So this, this radar technician from the CIA, retired from the CIA, suggested that, Don, you have to look at where all the separate radar lobes actually intersect, where they, they may bisect as far as uh, 
back at that time. And one of the things that we looked into was the fact that there were other radar facilities no along this band, long shutdown, no longer in existence, that were in existence back in 47 in conjunction with a lot of that testing with the atomic bomb, the rocket testing, other research being conducted at that time. And so you had radar in Alamogordo, you had radar south of Socorro, you had radar in Vaughan, you had radar in Albuquerque, you had radar in Clovis, you had radar in Roswell. And where did their separate radar lobes all happen to intersect? But in Lincoln County, exactly where this crashed in 1947 at all. So the frequency would have all spiked. It would have shot up to the point that we had no effect or we had no uh, knowledge of what this uh, spiking of that frequency would have had on our own aircraft. And that's one of the things he encouraged us to do that we needed to go back to 47 and see if this was creating a zone mm -hmm. and a specific area within our own airspace that was creating effects, negative effects on our own aircraft. If it was creating our, our navigation, our, our very own instrumentation to have a negative effect. And so we're looking into that now. And if that should be determined, if it affected our own aircraft negatively, we may then be able to surmise that it may have also had a negative effect on this unknown craft back at that time. That aside from the weather, that those radar lobes may indeed have caused a malfunction. And so let's stay tuned. It's something we're looking into. It's something that uh, we, we have, uh, again, a high level Radar Tech, retired from the CIA, is encouraging us, and he's going to assist us in looking into this. And so it's something we will report on, on in a, a future episode of uh, No Earthly Explanations. And that's something I think that needs to be touched on, because that makes a lot of sense. Because for me, being that it was a, a bad electrical storm, and we talked about the material of the craft, we talked about the type of material it is, and we're talking about where they're coming from, how fast they're going. I can't see the lightning being a cause to take down a craft like this. I would assume that if their intelligence was at the at the point of making something so incredible that a lightning storm would be a, no concern to them whatsoever because of the way that they travel. I would right. almost think that they would use lightning storms as way of travel <laughs> to almost yeah. conceal themselves. Electromagnetism. And in right. fact, even <clears throat> the power of that be pretty much concluded already back then that we were dealing with electromagnetic propulsion, mm -hmm. that it was free energy, that it was drawing it right out of the atmosphere. Uh, though it also would make it make the craft then a flying lightning rod, that it could then attract a bolt of lightning to the point that it would be uh, fatal, it would be terminal, that it would be such a, uh, a, 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 a overwhelming upsurge of power that it may have been to its detriment. We don't know that, we don't know that. No. And yet we also have to consider that as those of us familiar with the storms down in the Southwest mm -hmm. and the monsoons and how quickly they develop that you can get caught as we ourselves were at times. And because it's high desert where the lightning strikes the ground, mm -hmm. and, uh, during the drought uh, conditions that there is a constant fear of fire for because of the lightning striking the ground and that you can have six inches of rain in one pasture and nary a drop in another pasture just a half a mile away. So it was something we experienced ourselves that you can get caught totally mm -hmm. unprepared. And so it's possible that an aircraft could also get caught up in a storm without any prior knowledge or uh, anticipation of, of such conditions. Especially so, if it was a high intensity one, as history states. We have to um, be uh, at least cognizant 
of all these poss possible scenarios. And that's why as the investigation goes, we remain very fluid as to what may have caused it. But I, I, I need to emphasize that we never saw a report and none of the officers, none of the crash investigators involved ever provided us with a final resolution. They never came up with any determination as to what caused the crash that mm -hmm. uh, we've never, you know, been made aware of. Well, don't you think it's funny? Here we are 75 years later and we're still investigating what caused the crash. So obviously we can't just sweep it under the rug and say, well, we figured it all out. We know exactly what it is. We can't talk about it anymore because here we are still talking about it with new information that we're actually going back and reopening the file to say, let's figure this part out. And isn't it amusing that even at the time that as quickly as it, it was all explained away as being nothing more than a weather balloon device, that the wreckage still went on to Wright Field, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, for mm -hmm. testing and analysis. This was, um, you know, eight years before Area 51, Groom Lake, even existed, was even, you know, uh, as far as even originated. So the true Area 51 being Foreign Technology Division at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, if they recovered a MiG fighter from Soviet Russia, all of the German and Japanese technology post World War II, it all went to Wright Patterson in Dayton, Ohio. And so did all the wreckage from Roswell, where they made every effort to ascertain the origin, the source of the wreckage. And failing that, they made every effort to reverse engineer, to replicate this highly extraordinary wreckage that to this day, I still maintain, they cannot find the on button. Britt, I had one of the flight engineers at Roswell in 1947. Before he died, he said to me, Don, before I go, you gotta find out how that damn thing flew. I mean, these were the engineers who could take the silver plates, the B-29s, you know, the bombers that dropped those two atomic bombs on Japan mm -hmm. at World War II. And he would say, we could, you know, we could take one of those aircraft apart down to the last rivet and put them back together again. And yet here he is expressing, you know, his own lack of understanding and comprehension of what they were dealing with, with the craft at Roswell. And he says to me, Don, you got to find out how that damn thing flew. It didn't have a moving part on it. So what do you reverse engineer? There's no engine, no propulsion. And so we start getting into thought projection, the idea that the pilot gets into the ship and just by his very, you know, brain waves, he's able to control and steer and direct the craft. So, but, so again, how do you replicate that technology? So that's one of the reasons that I still maintain that after 75 years, it's still a cover-up of ignorance. We don't know from where, from how, from how, and, and, and from, from why. We still have no answers. So it's one of the reasons that they haven't disclosed the ignorance that their aircraft that are still flying through our airspace with total impunity. They can't do a damn thing about it. And Roswell it. <laughs> was the very beginning of all of this. And it, it really sent you know, shockwaves through the Pentagon because we didn't know if this was a vanguard of an approaching invasion. Right. We didn't know if we were dealing with benevolent as far as space beings that were here to help us or more accurately, we were going to make sure that we developed the technology before the Russians or anyone else did, because heaven help us if another power on earth is able to replicate that superior technology. And just like that, we would take a second seat and our superpower status would evaporate within days. Well, and as I said to you before, Don, in many of our conversations, that topic alone, like what you just stated, 
you that is not a weapon you want in just anybody's hands. So if it lands on U.S. soil, you don't want it leaking out to your, you know, your enemies, I should say, to know that, hey, we've got some amazing technology here that if we can replicate, we don't want this to anybody else. We want to be the leading in the war. We want to be the leading with the biggest and best missiles ever, you know? So obviously the quick response to this is we don't have anything. It was weather balloon. Everybody shut up. We don't have anything. And then you hide it away. And Nothing go work on it. Yeah. Exactly. Giant magic trick. Nothing to see here. You did not see what you think you just saw. Because the key factor is we do not want anybody else to know what amazing thing just landed in our backyard. And we're going to keep this to ourselves until we're ready. And when we unleash it, we're going to be in full control over the globe. And what has been so frustrating has been how often we would locate a witness. Finally. Because we had to actually find these people. It wasn't a case of where, oh, there was a directory, all those involved with Roswell in 1947. And it was just a matter of giving them a call and hoping they would divulge, you know, all their deep, dark secrets, what happened in 47. We had to find these people. It took months. It took years. And how often we would finally locate someone and, oh, they just died a year ago. Mm. There were times, oh, they passed away six months ago. The worst example was we spoke to the wife as she was just returning from the funeral. And the, the just absoluteness of whatever information they possess, it's gone forever. We lost it. We'll never have another chance. But it motivated us to work all the harder to find the next one while we still had time. And to think that most of the witnesses took it with them. They took what they knew to their graves with them, not even divulging the truth to their spouses, to their families. And all the more demonstrating to us that this event was so big that they couldn't even share it with their loved ones. And so, sorry, disqualifies balloon, rocket plane, anything else you want to suggest because something of this magnitude, you at least would confide to your spouses. And many of them did. Many of them on their very deathbeds. That's why deathbeds, which are admissible in a court of law, they, they did provide us with the continuing pieces of the puzzle which we've spelled out in our best-selling books. Our Witness to Roswell book was the number one selling UFO book in the world for two straight years. It's been optioned for the next movie. Our first book, UFO Crash at Roswell, was made into the Golden Globe-nominated movie Roswell, starring Kyle MacLachlan, uh, Martin Sheen, Dwight Yoakam. And our books, such as a Roswell case closed, which is our day in court where we present our best argument, our opening statements, our evidentiary, all of our eyewitness testimony, all of our deathbed testimonies and our closing arguments. We've done the Roswell chronology where minute by minute, hour by hour, we it's a coffee table pictorial. And even for the 75th anniversary, we will have a 75th edition of Witness to Roswell coming out in June. New chapters, new witnesses, uh, all new photographs. And so it's a 75th edition of the granddaddy of all UFO cases. The books are all available online at Amazon, at Barnes and Noble bookstores, all fine bookstores, and still all available and so the information is there as we have uh, been able to uh, put it together, comprise it to the point that we present it for the lay person to assimilate, to understand, because this is, in my eyes, in my mind, for having, again, been as proactive as my partner Thomas J. Carey and I have been for the past 20 years the biggest story of the millennium and the case 
is still under investigation. We are still fluid. And in fact, we're actually planning on the next archaeological dig as we speak. The case is still open, Don. Can't close it. It's not going to close anytime soon. No, and until the government finally fesses up, until the government finally does open the files, even to the uh, those in the Oval Office, the Jimmy Carters and the Bill Clintons and the Donald Trumps, who continue to lament the fact that even in the capacity of commander in chief, they were unable to get the truth about Roswell. That's how big this is, that mm -hmm. even the president is denied. And I'm sorry, denied a weather balloon? Denied a crash dummy explanation? No, it's because it's even bigger than the presidency. Well, and you can only, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. And yet, if it's just a weather balloon, you wouldn't keep, you know, trying to shush people up as quickly as possible and tell people, well, you're not a privy to this information and you can't have this information. But if it was just a weather balloon, I think everybody would have a privy to this information. Yes, it would, it would have long been accepted as the final <laughs> resolution, final explanation to what transpired back in 47. And it's because, as I mentioned, we've interviewed over 600 witnesses directly or indirectly involved. And every one of them endorses, subscribes to, has signed affidavits to, that this was indeed a craft of unknown origin. It was not manufactured on this planet. And the government is batting zero. They cannot provide a single witness to the contrary. You'd think they would have been, they would have managed to even come up with a phony witnesses, a phony witness to that effect. But again, they're, uh, they're, they're playing off of their expectation that the press will still run interference, still remain their willing accomplices, and still run interference. And that's where we come in. And that's where we will continue to keep the pressure on as to what truly did happen back in 1947. And there you have it, boots on the ground, getting dirty. <laughs> And getting to the bottom of it well and this is a great start for you know for the listeners and for everyone thank you for coming back and listening to no earthly explanation i know that being the 75th anniversary of roswell it's left us with no earthly explanation of what really happened because you're not going to get it from the government and so yes i said that i said it right here <laughs> um and i i second that <laughs> you know the, the important thing is, is that we are, we are boots on the ground. We are getting to the bottom of it. The case is still open and we're going to continue to do so as well as other interesting topics on no earthly explanation. It won't just always be um, about Roswell, even though that is kind of our home base, right, Don? I mean, that is kind of the smoking gun, just saying. It's a linchpin, uh, it's a linchpin yes, because <laughs> it's what got me certainly involved with this capacity and certainly before that with uh, my scientific director, the late Dr. Jalen Heineck. But then to find out after he had passed away, that he also was beginning to investigate Roswell and encouraging us even posthumously that this needs to be investigated. So I'd like to believe that he's smiling down right now because we picked up the gauntlet and we will not finish this until we get the government to finally acknowledge that it did indeed happen, just as all these witnesses have sworn that it has. Exactly. And... Let us not forget, J. Allen Hynek was also a skeptic, not a believer, when he went into it. Everyone, and everything saw. changed. Everything changed his opinion with his own field work. And I think one of the books, too, I want to throw out there as well for the listeners to also pick up by Don is Cover Up at Roswell, another fantastic book written by Donald Schmidt that does a lot of explanation. So many great questions are answered in that book. If you want to find it, like he said, Amazon, Books a Million, all those great places, pick up that book and read it, please. And as we're now at the end of our show, which always, I'm just going to flat out says it sucks because I love our conversations, Don, and you are family to me and I always love it. And I want you to know that I do believe you're making J. Allen Hynek very proud. I think he, you know, after your work and time with him, he'd be extremely proud of you for everything you've done and everything you're continuing to do 
for all the hard work and continuing, you know, continuing on the legacy that he started as well with with Kufos and you guys. Thank you. I'm I'm humbled. I'm flattered, and I couldn't have a a better partner. So, and coming from you, Britt, thank you. Thank you, Don. That means a lot. You're going to make me cry, and I can't end a show in tears. It's just not right. I can't do that. On <laughs> radio. <laughs> So for the listeners, thank you again so much for coming out and listening tonight. Um, I want to go ahead and throw out a couple of uh, handles for you guys to look us up. You can find us on Facebook at No Earthly Explanation. You can also find us on Instagram at No Earthly Explanation. If you have questions or things or comments or anything you want us to talk about uh, in regards to any kind of paranormal or the UFO world or Roswell, you can reach us at No Earthly Explanation at gmail.com or... You can also send us a voice message over at anchor.fm forward slash no earthly explanation. And you can leave us a message and we can hear your wonderful voice asking us any question that pops into your head and we would love to answer it. You can find us anywhere on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, Anchor, the list goes on and on. So find us, subscribe, listen, because the fun is just starting, everybody. We will be having future guests that uh, we'll be announcing as they are scheduled. So we look forward to, as we said at the beginning of the very first episode, that this is going to be a roller coaster. You're going to have to hold on because it's an adventure that we both experienced. And now we're inviting you to join us. So the best is yet to come. That's right. And you better buckle up tight because if Don and I are leading this plane, (laughs) I can't promise where it's going to go. So you better freaking hold on. (laughs) So on that note, Don, Mr. Troublemaker himself, on that note. (laughs) So we will be back again in two weeks and we cannot wait to bring on our next guest and have another amazing time chit-chatting and discussing stuff that may, might get me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Sleep with the, the truth light. often does hurt. But hmm? the truth often does hurt. But welcome back. Join us each episode. And we'll see you all again on No Earthly Explanations. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content.